director that I do a lot of the 16 sports stuff with. You guys, we talked about pretty in depth last night. His name is on the original patent for the John Deere autonomous tractor that expired about a week or two before that one debuted. So, had to get the green guys favorable there. But, uh, uh, I'm Lawrence Donnelly. I farm about 130 miles straight west of here. I'm also working for Dawn Underground Ag nowadays. This is my contact info. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter. There's my cell phone or email. But, uh, you know, when we first started putting this together Tuesday, I thought we were going to meld our PowerPoints and have a good old time, and uh, so I just threw all my notes together. First of all, I better tell you, I'm an unconventional, conventional farmer. If that makes sense for you guys. I'm not organic, but I'm test part of my dawn, deal with Dawn is that we're testing organic theories and stuff like that. We're going to start out with an introduction to my farming operation, basically. But first of all, I want to start touching on integrated weed management. That's where my mind goes when we start talking about tools. I don't instantly go to iron. In one of the conversations last night, and I probably scared a few people when they started talking about, you know, this morning's conversation was bacterial fungi ratios on that. I think we really need to start exercising our minds, figuring out where we're at. You know, if we can start figuring out how to prevent a weed versus fighting a weed, that's going to be pretty powerful. And I'll give a compliment to this meeting up here three years ago when I first showed up here. That, that was really part of my mindset, and I, I've built upon it since. But, uh, you know, that just goes, for me, one of the most powerful tools we possess is the human mind. You know, we really need to be ex educating ourselves how can we tackle some of this stuff. It's not going to come out of a bottle or jug, but we can learn how to manage and get for it. At my operation, part of the, I'll call it the dumbing down or the numbing of what I was taught growing up, started in 2006 when we started figuring out how to interstate our corn. You know, I, I started paying attention to what my forefathers did back in the early 1900s. Some of this stuff was very common before we became conventional farmers. You know, back then we all were organic. We all had to learn how to manage. You know, some of my earliest learnings were paying attention to our grandparents and that, you know, everybody calls cover crops now. Back then it was green manure. They had to learn how to cycle nutrients, all that stuff. So if we can start going back and grabbing that knowledge and bringing it forward, tying up with the technology that we have today, that's where I think we can start moving forward together. Another one of the things as we have all done my farm is nowadays when we do cereal crops or soybeans, we're doing it in a relay or companion cropping. So we'll plant a cereal crop in that, and then we'll come in and uh, relay soybeans in there, or we're starting to play with other crops. What that is doing is go back to that ecological part, and we're starting to use plants to suppress weed. And on a cereal rye soybean crop, my goal is, even as a conventional farmer, I'm not using any herbicides unless we have to. But uh, if we really get wild in our farm, another thing when we take the relay out, then we'll install buckwheat or something like that to further that canopy. So we can fill that canopy in void instead of having weeds on bare dirt. We're just constantly cycling the plants, building that system, which is bringing us all the way around to now that we're starting to look at them. Uh, I think the official word people are leaning towards is permaculture. I kind of chuckled last night when uh, I think we started talking about uh, we need that clean green period on corn. How many guys would be proud of this cornfield? There is corn in there. If you look, uh, I'll try to get this working. How do I get the? That's what I was trying to do. Stop showing up there. So right there's a corn row. Here's a corn row. There's a corn row. No tilled corn and a two year old clover. As you're going to see here shortly, we've been working with Dawn Equipment. We built an uh, in row roller about quite a few years ago here. There's what that field looked like a couple weeks later when we went in and rolled the, the clover down. All we did on that field is we rolled it. Well, we no tilled corn in there, mowed it off because we didn't have the roller ready, and then we rolled it twice. A couple weeks later, or this fall, this is what that corn looked like. On the total, total system approach, that field ended up with 147 bushel and acre corn. 
no inputs other than the neighbor hole from Penn Tech Hogman or, you know, we didn't go out there and see what nutrient value was it, but it was pretty strong. So, you know, seed and no till or Hogman are. And uh, they're just quick and dirty what that corn looked like close up. I mean, Aaron was in the field that one, I think that was back in July. It looked pretty ugly. You know, but as I said last night, to truly start understanding some of this stuff, you need to bring it to zero and build up from there. I think we know where, where we're at now, where we're going, but it's, we're still in great potential. We're going to move that test plot home this year, so I'm starting to look, you know, we're, gonna, we're doing it with red clover, but now we're going to start playing with hairy vetch and more red clover. We've got crimson clover plot out there. We're going to try to expand, see where, what clovers are working. But a lot of this goes back to what Joe Clapperton told me many years ago, clover and corn are friends. So I think, you know, one of the things I alluded to last night, going back to that clean green period, I think we need to start paying attention to the color of the plants we're growing with other plants. We don't exactly need to be clean and green like everybody told us to. Now to get to where we're actually supposed to go to, I believe, the tool part of this category. One of the first introductions to me planting green in that was the Dawn ZRX roller. And I'm just, I don't know if you want me to go through the pluses, and these are the pluses and minuses I see with each tool that we're going through here. You know, to me, we're combining passes, we're saving a trip over the field. The biggest thing I see with the Dawn ZRX versus most of the rollers is it's flexible. It can follow the soil better. And then the biggest key is we're main, building and maintaining a residue map. On the flip side, yes, it costs money up front. It's not cheap, but, you know, the new version is over here today. You can kind of see that. They have brought the cost down. The other negative thing I see is timing. The further north we get, the harder it is going to be a match that up with planter. Which, coincidentally, opens the door for the in-ground roller. So now, if the ZRX on your planter doesn't work, we can plant when it's fit in our conditions, but then we can utilize the in-ground roller to build our biomass and create that residue map. For me, that the key pieces are timing. We can plant when it's fit, roll when it's fit. Cost, it's going to be a lot cheaper than other options out there. Maintenance, two bearings per row. So it should be pretty ma manageable. But the key part for me is we're going to be build and maintain that residue mass to suppress weeds. Other pl the biggest plus, too, is feed and acres. We can cover a lot of ground in a hurry with it. Biggest negative, it's going to take precision driving. So we're going to need RTK, stuff like that. When you're starting to run an inch or two off a plant, you're going to need that. Uh, the other negative, the only one I can think of, is it may require multiple passes. But it's all getting in that mindset of building that residue map. Here. Granted, as I said, I'm an unconventional conventional farmer, so the seeding rates I'm using are not going to be anywhere near you're going to be using for organic. That's probably 20 pounds of cereal rye right, right there. And as you can see there, the corn was probably at, like that at that time. So if we're going to start pushing that two, three bushel of rye, you're going to have a lot bigger residue mat. We're probably going to have more rows in between that row, so you will get more uniform coverage. Uh, another option we've been playing with the last couple of years, you know, most of you guys have heard or seen the Romo. This is the version we ran, I believe, two years ago. This is the Impeller version. Negatives on this one. They're a power hog. They take a lot of power. Overall expense is going to be high. But the one key I want you to start thinking about as we're looking at some of these tools, just like a conventional farmer would, would need, we're going to need to look at different modes of action. So some, some weeds are going to take a roller crimper, some are going to take a mower, some are going to take the electric weeder, some are going to take a flammer. We need all these different tools moving forward. Uh, other negatives on this one? Cost. It's not going to be cheap to finish this project. You know, this is a mechanical machine. It takes a lot of precision, a lot of fine machining, tooling, a lot of development money left to be spent on this stuff. Other big negative is it's non-selective. Whatever that mower blade hits, it's going to cut. Uh, 
you guys seen this version last year? You know, another pl- plus, they're excellent cleanup tools. Now, I love the possibility here, and this is something that needs to be explored, but we need tools now, so that's kind of why the forefront is going to the roller, I do believe. Uh, this is the version we ran this summer. I think some of, it was at some of your guys' farms this summer. It was at the UW. There again, we're trying to figure out that balance of power and stuff like that. It takes power to make this stuff work. We're looking at other options, but it's going to take time. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a resident ex- expert here in the room, so I'm not going to attempt to tell you all the benefits of that. You know, the p- potential focus aspects of some of these tools. I was at Rodale last Monday, and I think what's really going to be neat start moving forward is they're looking at starting to combine some of these tools. You know, there's probably a pretty good chance there might be a ZRX with a flame burner on front, or they're even talking electric weeders. Compounding some of these tools, kind of what you were asking for, could be coming. You know, my biggest negative on the flamer, I'm high residue. How's that going to work in a high residue situation? I don't, you know, I don't want to redefine burn down. You know, that, that potential for plant damage is very high in my situation, but I think, Jason, are you in this room right now? Jason's here. They, they actually build the burner package and that, so if you catch him, feel free to talk to a guy like him. He knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. You know, last night the electric leader was talked about pretty in depth. Another great tool. The neat part is, I remember back in the 70s when it was the Lysico leader. They couldn't give them away. You know, if that would have been smart, I remember an auction. There was 19 of them on an auction, $500 a piece. Should have been, should have been buying that day, but, uh, you know, this is proven technology. Potential for refinement. There again, as I said, Rodale, they're talking, they're looking, they want to talk to the weeder guys. You know, can we put that little rod right in front of a planter unit? Burn down as we plant. You know, another neg- negative on these, the cost. And I guess the, as a biological farmer, the biggest thing I'm worried about is what that electric shock is doing to the soil beneath us. You know, we'll, here we're trying to build biology. It is a lightning bolt. You know, that's natural, but have a lightning bolt every foot or two, how natural is that? So, you know, then the other thing is the damage to the crops. Is the damage already done by the time you can run a weeder? You know, you've already had the weed in there, it's tall enough. Are you just doing it as a harvest date at that point? Neat one, getting ready for this one, I found the old wheel puller. You know, the seed corn guys still use something like this. But, you know, if you watched a bunch of videos, they're running this, pulling weeds over top of the canopy. Simple, cheap, and effective. But there again, you know, is it just in harvest state at that point? You know, worst thing I've seen is it's pulling that root out. All of a sudden, you got root balls laying out there. You're running a lot more dirt through the combine. I guess I worry about the total package setting up the, right from planting to harvest. You know, I want to run as little dirt through, through the machine as possible. Ah, uh, another expert in the room on this one. I did ask him last night if I could borrow this picture, so I think Mike said he's got a video with him. If you actually want to see this one in operation, you know, the plus is I've seen. It looks like it should be very effective on small weeds, very low impact. You know, my mind start, was thinking before we talked last night, you know, I'm watching the vinegars and stuff like that. Could we run that through the power washer, throw a little heat to it, make them more effective? But then again, negative is the cost. Speed for our, you know, speed. How many acres an hour can that machine cover? But uh, if we're really going to go wild, this is an unforgotten knowledge. Last week when I was out in Delaware and Pennsylvania, almost every orchard I drove by had ducks and geese out there, chickens out there. You know, we, we had young gals here last night, and they were talking about their apple orchards. Value income, you know, value added income. We can start compounding enterprises getting that side benefit out of it. You know, biggest negative, manpower and time. Running a herd of birds or a flock of birds is going to take time and effort. Learning, training them, stuff like that all takes time. Probably the biggest negative is fencing. Another thing I tend to go to is food safety. So having a flock of birds in an orchard, is that going to be a negative on E. coli? I know that's big news on the organic side. I know a good friend of mine played quite a bit with this. He 
can be simple, you know, get a tarp, lay down that plastic. That can't be field scale, but from the picture, this one was pretty good sized field. You know, and you just have to start rolling and unrolling tarps. You know, as we start losing herbicides, this, you know, the conventional farmers are going to have to start thinking about some of this. You know, fortunate enough, I was over in France here a year or two ago, and they banned a lot of herbicides. They're out hand weeding in the road. Some of this is coming to everybody. You know, but there again, plus, pluses and minuses. You know, it looks effective. It's reusable. But again, what's that heat under the mat residue doing to the biology? You know, the first thing I think of, we're, we're pretty breezy, so what's wind going to do to it? And then long term, you have the disposal effect. Another thing I, as I was getting ready for this, I kind of went on the really roadside. You know, how many people are paying attention to something like this, using ultraviolet light to kill weeds? You know, the first thing everybody's going to say, it looks potential, but uh, is it going to be able to go field scale? What's the power requirements? You know, it's experimental right now, but as I dove deeper, scale up the potential is there. You know, they're, they're just dragging it through the yard, burning lawn up. First thing I look at this, and I'm like, this could be a good potential for the planter mounted ideal. We're working, you know, we're looking for something to burn that row on the planter. That get on that website, and uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I do have it on my iPad if you want to see a close up. But it does have the horsepower per foot requirement. You know, so they're getting further advanced into some of this. Can we scale it up? Is the next part. And then we're going to end with this slide. But uh, Brian touched on it pretty hard already. This is where I see a lot of this going. You know, the, the price range I'm hearing is ten to twenty-five thousand dollars is what they want to get these light vehicles in operation for. How many of you got an old tractor that you're using as your main tractor right now? Probably in that same price range. So if suddenly we can afford something like this. You know, and I, I, I use this one specifically because I like the way it's hand weaving. You know, it's identifying plants and it's hand-picking weeds. Now, you and I would get bored after the first five minutes. I might be bored after a minute, but uh, start thinking about that. That machine can be out there 24-7. They don't care. You know, it can give us that next level of management tool that some of us might be looking for. You know, and I, I, I tend to look at, as I said earlier, the big picture. Okay, if it can hand-pick that, it can probably place the seed at the same time. And then for later in the season, if it can hand pick, it can hand pick our produce. So bringing it full circle, I see the potential where we can start using, you know, if we're going to maximize the use of these things, we've got to look at the full season stuff. So with that, I think we'll open up to questions and.